I'm Professor Carl Sufani, Management Practice Professor of Financial Economics and Policy, Director of the Cambridge Executive MBA, um, and also Director of the Circular Economy Center here at the Judge Business School, part of the University of Cambridge. I'm hugely honored to be joined today by Cambridge Judge Alunus, uh, Eben Upton, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Raspberry Pi and founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, Eben completed his uh, studies at Cambridge with a PhD in computer science at St. John's College before joining Cambridge Judge to study for an executive MBA in 2009. So uh, good morning, Eben, and thank you very, very much for being with us this morning. Good morning. Uh, thank, well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, start um, by having a, a discussion about some of the great achievements that you have um, actually um, shown, uh, starting the Raspberry Pi and the progress and the journey of the Raspberry Pi. So I'd like to start by congratulating you on your recent honorary fellowship with the National Museum of uh, Computing in, in Bletchley, home of the Codebreakers, alongside your wife and co-founder Liz. Um, in recognition of outstanding um, individuals who made significant and lasting contribution to the field of computing and technology. Uh, do tell us a little about uh, what inspired you to develop the original Raspberry Pi computer, uh, Eben. Well, Raspberry Pi, I think when I first met you in 2009, the Raspberry Pi I, the Raspberry Pi story had already been, already been going for three or four years. I was a director of studies in computer science at St. John's um, in the middle part of uh, that decade, in the middle, sort of from, I think, from 2004 to 2007. Um, and the director of studies role is a fantastic one, right? Because you organize the undergraduate teaching uh, in your subject um, and you try and find more undergraduates. Um, and so the first part was great because you get to hang out with these really, really bright young people uh, and it sort of keeps you, you know, kind of keeps you connected to your, you know, keeps you connected to, uh, um, to, your, to your college. Um, but the second part was actually really dispiriting because we really, really struggled um, to find people who wanted to be uh, the next generation of computer scientists. Um, we were at a point, I think, as a university uh, where we had um, roughly 200, 250 applicants um, for a little under 100 places, which is a, you know, it's a fantastic, you know, if you're a, if you're a student, if you're a, a, a school kid or you're a parent, uh, it was a fantastic environment to try and get your child into Cambridge because that's an amazing ratio. Very, very few Cambridge courses have that kind of two to one, three to one uh, ratio of applicants. Um, but that number, 200, 250, represented a very steep decline from where we'd been in the 1990s. Um, and, and so a bunch of us at the university started to ask ourselves what had happened. Um, and really, Raspberry Pi is the, uh, yeah, Raspberry Pi is, I always call it a hypothesis test, really. Um, what the, the hypothesis we're testing is that we had students because students have programmable computers. Uh, programmable computers went away uh, and the students went away. And if we bring programmable computers back, then perhaps we'll get the students back. And, and really that's what we've been doing for now, I guess, uh, a little over 15 years um, is testing this hypothesis. Uh, I think we've had, some, we've had some really positive results from that. Um, but along the way, I mean, I think along the way, we've discovered that if you put general purpose, yeah, we, we are, we're champions of general, we describe ourselves as champions of general purpose computing. Uh, you know, we think that gen the general purpose computer, it is one of the most powerful tools that's ever been created by humankind. Uh, and I think along the way, what we've realized is if you put general purpose computing in the world, um, yes, you know, young people take to it in the way that I took to general pur purpose computing when I was an eight year old, um, but a whole lot of other people do uh, as well. And that's kind of come to define a lot of what we do at Raspberry Pi. Great, thank you very much, um, Eben. Uh, last year, Raspberry Pi celebrated its 10th year anniversary. So thinking about what you set out to achieve, uh, could you um, kindly share with us what your uh, proudest successes have been during the last decade and explore what the future holds for the Raspberry Pi? Well, perhaps I'd maybe kind of pick out three things. And of course, the, the, one, the obvious one to start with is what progress are we making with our hypothesis test? You know, what, what progress are we making with the educational mission of the organization? Um, uh, we've seen really good numbers. If you imagine, you know, I mentioned this, this number, this metric, how many people are applying to the University of Cambridge to study computer science. That was a number that had come down from about 600 in the 1990s to about 200 by 2008, which was the Nadia, the lowest point. Um, last year, that number was over 1400. Um, and and you know, while we are not the only organization that has been contributing to the Renaissance, 
in um, in interest in computers and computing education, um, I, I, I certainly think we can claim, we can one way or another, as an organization uh, and as a platform, uh, we can claim some responsibility for some of that improvement. So, I mean, that's a great, you know, that alone is a great success. We, of course, have had some support from central government there. Uh, there has been curriculum reform uh, um, in about 2014, 2015. Uh, and then over the last two or three years, there's been teacher training reform, which is, of course, another important part of, um, uh, I guess, stabilizing and improving the uh, the formal uh, aspects of computing education. So there's certainly been some government action, but by and large, the improvement that we've seen has been driven by distributed action, by voluntary action among, among individuals, um, and I guess by sort of self-interested corporate social responsibility action uh, from uh, from organizations, from commercial organizations in the field. So that's been a fantastic thing to be part of. Um, but as Raspberry Pi has grown, we've started to kind of perceive other ways in which um, in which we as an organization can, can make a difference um, in the world. And probably the one I pick out, the one that I am happiest about, um, is again around this notion of general purpose computing. Um, there are a huge number of organizations in the world um, that are, we would call them reluctant hardware companies, or there were, we would call them reluctant hardware companies. And these are um, enterprises, often startups, often you know, generally not vast companies, start small companies, um, startups, um, who have some idea for a thing that they want to do. Uh, and that thing is generally a software product. Um, and the challenge is, and sort of good examples of this are things like um, uh, digital signage, um, uh, industrial automation and monitoring, um, maybe thin client platforms. So these organizations who have a piece of software IP, a piece of differentiated IP they want to put in the world. And of course, the problem with software is software needs to run somewhere. Software has no use on its own. It needs a piece of hardware to run on. And so when we, when we started Raspberry Pi, or we started putting Raspberry Pis in the world, one of the things we discovered very quickly outside of this original education and enthusiast target market was that this thing was getting sucked into organizations which had previously been having to build hardware platforms. And one thing we found very early on was that organizations were replacing their um, little random hardware platform with Raspberry Pis. And what it was allowing people to do was it was allowing um, established organizations who had been forced into the business of producing computer hardware to exit that business and focus on what was important. So that brought them efficiencies. Um, and it was allowing an entirely new group of, of, of companies to start um, uh, and, and, and do, interesting, do interesting new things. They, they just simply wouldn't have been able to do if they'd had to build a hardware platform. So you've got this kind of very direct um, contribution to society, you know, a very obvious direct charitable contributions to society of um, uh, giving young people an opportunity to, um, uh, to 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 learn about computers, to kind of generating a new generation of engineers. But then in the field of, I guess, in the field of engineering and entrepreneurship, you were you were incubating new organizations, giving new organizations an ability to exist, bringing efficiencies to existing organizations, effectively making more efficient use of the pool of engineers who already exist. You know, an engineer who is no longer building a non-differentiating hardware platform for one of these reluctant hardware companies can go and do something more useful. So we do think that in addition to generating a bunch of new engineers, we have probably freed up thousands to tens of thousands of existing engineers to go do more useful stuff. So we're really, really proud to have done that. And that's absolutely not something that we had um, considered that we'd anticipated uh, when we started the program and when we set out to put general purpose computers in the world. Um, what's quite unusual even is that you started Raspberry Pi as a foundation. Why was that? Raspberry Pi was a little bit different because we were trying to accomplish a social good. Uh, yeah, this is an organization that was set up to uh, address what we thought was, but was an emerging and extremely serious challenge. Um, to the ongoing viability of, uh, of of academic computer science in the UK, uh, and then obviously subsequently to the ongoing viability of the UK um, engineering uh, sector. And of course, the interesting thing is, it's uh, you know when, we, when we're looking back in time, the word UK comes up a lot, right? You know, we look, look back in time, and this is an organisation which is based in the UK that was created to solve problems in the UK. Now, one of the interesting, you know, when I talk about the organisation today, you can just strip the word UK out. 95%, although almost every Raspberry Pi is made in the UK, 95% of them are exported. And probably 90, 95% of the impact, both the charitable educational impact and this kind of industrial uh, efficiency impact that Raspberry Pi has, 90-95% uh, of that is happening outside the UK. So now, the big, the big and early surprise of Raspberry Pi, driven partly by a lot of enthusiast enthusiasm for the platform, but also by that um, uh, that sort of early transition, the, the early parts of our transition to being an industrial computer vendor, um, was that we sold a lot more Raspberry Pis than we were expecting. 
I think we had some good surprises in terms of the cost rush of the platform. Um, so very early on, what we did with the organization was we split it apart in two. We effectively took the trading activity, put it in a wholly owned commercial trading subsidiary, and then kept the foundation to do charitable work, to do charitable good work. This, this inside out way of doing things where you start with the foundation and then build the commercial business underneath it. Uh, it's novel. Um, it's very uh, it's certainly novel for the people involved. It's the first time I've done something that isn't a commercial startup. It's been, it's been wonderful for me. I've never done anything for remotely this length of time in my life, and I'm still excited about it 15, over 15 years now since we started. Fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Eben. Uh, when it comes to the mission of the foundation, what are your biggest hopes for this coming decade? For what it will uh, do for children and education across the world? We started off in the UK, as I said. Um, and would increasingly the impact both of the commercial organization and the foundation have been have been they've been increasingly global. Um, I think probably the opportunities are obviously there's a requirement to sustain the work that we've done in the UK. Um, this stuff doesn't naturally, you know, the teacher training, um, the pressure to retain a high quality curriculum, because you know, there are people who would love to degrade the quality of this fantastic computer science curriculum that we've had for over half a decade now. Um, so there is a as we're required to, to retain and sustain the success that we've had in the UK. Um, but the real opportunity is to roll out some of those lessons internationally. We've had a fantastic um, uh, piece of uh, financial support uh, from the Ezra Charitable Trust at the tail end of uh, uh, 2021. Um, to uh, which has funded the the, uh, the foundation uh, to have a renewed focus on low and middle income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and India. Um, so there's a real opportunity there to take the lessons that we've uh, to take the lessons that we've learned in the UK. Obviously, you know, you, it's never possible in any environment to to sort of simple to uh, transfer those lessons in a simple minded way. You know, it's not a cookie cutter approach. But I think what we do have now is we have some understanding. We have the scars on our back. Uh, we have some collateral of various sorts that we can take into new developed world. Uh, markets that we can take into low and middle income countries uh, and start to make a difference there. Um, I was um, I was very lucky to go and uh, visit uh, some of our operations in Ghana and Kenya uh, in October last year. Uh, and just the hunger, just the level of hunger for education, just just absolutely remarkable. The, the quality of the people involved, the you know, quality of the people involved at the governmental level. I mean, it, made, it makes me weep, you know, the, the just how how smart how committed um, uh, the you know, governments are to securing a better future for their people. Uh, and I think there are contributions we can make there. And they're contributions because we have a decade of experience here in the UK in doing this stuff. They're contributions that we can make at a one, two year, two, three year time frame, rather than a 10 year time frame, hopefully. Fantastic, thank you very much, Eben. Uh, the global supply chain, if I may just move to uh, uh, something um, um, slightly different uh, with regard to um, the economic environment in general. The global supply chain crisis is something that is a uh, forefront in our minds. Uh, how has the Raspberry Pi navigated this and is the year ahead going to be better? It's It's been an incredibly challenging, very nearly two years now. Uh, it's been we, we've been in what I would consider to be a constraint environment for Raspberry Pi um, for 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 about two years. Um, a big part of the Raspberry Pi value proposition to those industrial customers that I mentioned is its availability. We are a build to inventory company, and we've been able to do that uh, in significant part because we we've adopted a very Henry Ford model. Um, that there is, it's no longer the case that you know you can. There is only one model of Raspberry Pi. But there aren't many models of Raspberry Pi. We don't extensive. We don't do. We don't even. We don't do mass customization of our products. We have a handful of different SKUs, and that's allowed us to build enormous amounts. So in good years, that now allows us to build and carry very, very substantial amounts of inventory. We've actually not been beaten back much further than your typical, um, uh, your, than your typical for our industrial customers, uh, your typical build to order company. So we now have products which are on three month lead times. You've gone from general mass availability to three month lead times. Um, that doesn't sound too bad, but for us, it's been uh, a. It is confusing for customers who we have trained to expect to expect just in time availability, um, and also it's been purchased at awful cost. Uh, and the awful cost that we've paid is that we've had to deprioritize our enthusiastic and educational customer base. Uh, you know, we are last year. Uh, we were sold about 5 million Raspberry Pis last year. That's down from 7 million Raspberry Pis the year before, 7 million Raspberry Pis the year before that. Um, 
almost all those 5 million units have, have gone to industry. It's been enough to sustain our REM customer base. We do feel a sense of responsibility to our REM customers. Uh, we do think that they have, they've invested in our platform. They've taken a risk uh, on Raspberry Pi. And so we do feel, and, and you know, when we say industrial customers, we're not talking about IBM here. You know, a lot of these organizations, you know, I said, we are, we've played this role in, in, in sustaining uh, small and medium enterprises who have sophisticated general purpose computing needs. And we've played a role in incubating a new generation of small enterprises, mom and pop organizations. So when I talk about supplying OEMs, often I'm talking about whether a couple, you know, a husband and wife and a couple of employees can pay their mortgages. You're talking about people, avoiding people going to the wall. We're now sustaining um, direct relationships with about 2,500 OEM, uh, OEM customers. We have, uh, and what you're doing there is somebody who comes to you and says, I want 10,000 Raspberry Pis tomorrow. And, you know, normal times, you'd be like, you absolutely have 10,000 Raspberry Pis. Now what we do is we call them up and say, do you really? Because I don't think you're going to make 10,000, whatever product you're embedding our product into, we don't think you're going to make 10,000 of them tomorrow. Do, do you really mean you want 1,000 of them and 1,000 next month and 1,000 the month after? Um, or do you actually mean that you want 500 this month and then 500 next month and then 500 the month after? And you're putting the number up because you want the comfort of holding inventory. If everyone is allowed the comfort of holding large amounts of inventory, it's a beggar your neighbor. Um, dynamic, which will which will cause it, it's the, it's the beggar your neighbor dynamic, which has caused the which has caused the supply chain crisis, um, and it's a dynamic which will sustain that crisis long after the underlying fundamentals have actually recovered, which they which they really are doing now. So we're doing these this this very intensive what we call uh, active management uh, of OEM accounts. Um, where do I think we are today? Uh, I think we're in our last bad quarter. Uh, in terms of supply, I think the supply is going to recover pretty abruptly in the second quarter. This quarter is probably as bad as any quarter we've had in terms of inbound component inventory. Next quarter will be a, call it a pre-pandemic quarter for us. So it will be between one and a half and two million years of inbound component inventory. We'll do our best to convert most of that to finished goods in the quarter. Um, the challenge is, of course, once you have backlogs, it's not enough to be, hey, I think actually underneath all this, our business has grown. Um, it's hard to measure, but I think we are probably an eight or nine million unit a year business, not a seven million unit business. Um, so, so A, we need more for that reason. B, we need more because we need to start to catch up on some of these backlogs. I think what you'll see through the first half of this year, you'll see a return to that, that, that real um, broad availability, uh, broad fully stocked availability, and then we'll be able to take some of those measures off. And our salespeople will be able to go back to being salespeople, right? Not anti-salespeople. You, know, you do not want your salespeople to have to to ask your customers to reduce the volume of their orders, uh, and that'll be uh, that'll be a wonderful uh, that'll be a wonderful transition for everybody. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, how important is sustainability in Raspberry Pi's business model mm -hmm. and projects, and what are the challenges, mm -hmm. and the balance between reshoring in the UK and offshoring, if I may? Um, of course, Raspberry Pis are small or physically small objects. I think you have to think about them in terms of what object they replace. So a Raspberry Pi is a physically small object, uh, and that means that it has, it has fewer atoms in, and therefore the supply chain that generates those atoms, that produces those atoms, is lighter weight than it would be in many of the devices that a Raspberry Pi um, uh, replaces. Um, of course, it's a low power consumption device as well. This is a, light, a physically compact and lightweight device, and therefore the logistical costs of moving it around the world are directly much lower than many of the things that it replaces. Um, and then, of course, it's a low energy consumption device. So this is a device which idles at about two watts, uh, peaks at about six or seven watts. You know, you can't really consume ten, even ten watts. The kind of idle power consumption of a, of a modern PC, even under full load, a Raspberry Pi won't consume that much energy. Um, so, there, so I think there are some good. There are some good elements there to the story. Um, we have we have to start to look in a little bit more detail. We have commissioned some work um, uh, to understand what the carbon uh, the carbon footprint, the carbon impact um, of Raspberry Pi manufacturer use and disposal uh, is. What was remarkable for me is it is entirely dominated by logistics. It's entirely dominated by logistics, and it's dominated by air freight. Um, and we're currently in an environment. If you imagine your if you're in a shortage environment. Um, you want to make sure that every rare, precious component that emerges from one of your vendor's factories um, immediately makes its way to your um, factory uh, and immediately gets turned into a product and immediately gets immediately sent to a customer and that customer immediately turns it into a product. You're back to the point about not allowing customers to, uh, to, to, build, um, to build inventory. Makes it into a product, makes it to an end user. 
So you really try and tighten. One of the ways that you survive a supply chain crisis is by tightening everything. And of course, air freight is a really important part of that. Um, so we do fly a lot of stuff around right now. Um, probably the resolution that's come from this this first round of, of carbon footprint work that we've done um, is that we are going to be extremely, we're going to be obsessive over the next two or three years about seeing how much stuff we can move to sea freight. Um, it's an interesting year that on the financial side, what's going to be really interesting for me is to understand whether it is a financial gain or a financial sacrifice that I make in order to obtain that um, uh, environmental improvement. Um, I suspect it's going to turn out because the downside is, of course, you, you lock a lot more capital up in your logistics chain. You know, you have a lot of dollars on a boat uh, moving around the world. Uh, and the question is, so you have dollars on a boat, but on the other hand, pound for pound, kilo for kilo, a, um, a sea freight is a lot cheaper than air freight. Um, so you're going to get a return. You're going to put some more capital in. You're going to get a return on that capital, in, a, a financial return on that capital in the form of reduced shipping costs. Um, and then you know, how does that compare to our, to our, to our, our, our weighted average cost of capital? Um, so that will be interesting to see. My suspicion is that this will generate at the cost of maybe some additional administrative burden, um, particularly forecasting burden, because, of course, you're adding latency into a system. Uh, you are playing the beer game even more aggressively. At the cost of some additional administrative effort and forecasting effort, you probably attain both a financial and an environmental improvement. Uh, that will take out something like 70% of the carbon footprint, uh, the fairly small residual carbon footprint uh, of Raspberry Pi. Um, beyond that, I think the uh, some of the metal work in the product, obviously metal is energy intensive to, uh, to, to produce. Um, well, to get a little bit of work, maybe it's very hard to deal with the metal that's embedded in the PCB because that's functional. That's a functional object, both electrically, because of course it brings power and signals. The, the copper in the PCB brings power to, um, uh, to, to, to the silicon devices on the device, uh, and it brings signals between them, and you can't get rid of it. Uh, in fact, even if you reduce the amount of copper, you make the copper thinner, then everything works less well. So I suspect probably the copper content of the device uh, is, a, is, a, is a fixed aspect. Where I think we might be able to make some progress is with the connector shells, the metal that's wrapped around the USB connectors and the Ethernet. Um, so we'll have a program, I think, next time we do a, a round of, uh, of, uh, of connector optimization. We're going to look at whether we can reduce the number of grounds of, uh, of metal of the uh, nickel-plated steel. Um, in the in the platform, that'll probably take out about you know best case that might take out ten or twenty percent of the residue. Um, but really, what we do, I think it's important to, fo to focus on the fact that what we're talking about here is incremental optimization of a device which is already incredibly, incredibly environmentally friendly. Um, you mentioned you mentioned offshoring, reshoring. Raspberry Pi is an unusual organization in that we started you know, for. A, uh, for, a, for a, a Western organization, we're unusual in that we started manufacturing in China and then we reshored. Uh, our manufacturing uh, to the United Kingdom, almost in its entirety now, uh, to the United Kingdom. So we build uh, almost all Raspberry Pi computers are built in South Wales. Uh, they're built in uh, Bridge End in Pencoid um, by Sony, by a division of Sony, a contract manufacturing division of Sony. We build in Wales because it is the best place in the world, certainly for a British company, to build uh, complicated electronic products. There's this enormous, as I say, there's a heritage of doing this. Um, there are facilities in place, there's talent in place. I can go in there and I can say, the question we always ask, what do you hate about building our products? You know, what is hard about building our products? What can we change about our products to make them easier to build, cheaper to build, quicker to build, to make them yield better when they come off the line? You know, what do you want us to do? Um, Raspberry Pi is an incredibly high, we, a modern Raspberry Pi is about 40 times as powerful, 40, 50 times as powerful as the Raspberry Pi we launched in 2012, and it costs the same amount. Um, why is that? Well, there's obviously some Moore's Law benefit in there, the kind of the residue where kind of Moore's Law is creeping to an end now, of that exponential, that annual exponential increase uh, in computing performance at a given price is coming to an end, but we have benefited from probably the last decade of full-throated um, uh, Moore's Law progress. But a lot of the benefit has been about incrementally ironing out the things that make this an expensive product to make. So our, manufacturing, our specific manufacturing cost, our products have become more complicated, but for a product of a particular complexity, our manufacturing cost has declined very rapidly because of this what we call DFM, Design for Manufacturability Activity. I don't know how, actually, I actually don't know how we would have coped as an organization if we'd been attempting to manage, remotely manage uh, an offshore manufacturing process uh, during the pandemic. Fantastic, thank you very much, Eben. Um, do you have any final thoughts to share with our global audience? Yeah, Raspberry Pi has been a um, it's been a, a very long journey for me. Now I was uh, I was um, 
uh, I was in my twenties when we first started thinking about Raspberry Pi, and I was, you know, sort of barely thirty when we when we actually uh, um, uh, started the foundation. Um, this is a very long period of time to work on something, uh, and I think I, I think I learned certainly early in the in, in the in the program um, was the value of surrounding yourself with people who. Uh, um, uh, again, this is another serendipity one, right? But the value of surrounding yourself with people who help you sustain your commitment um, to a project uh, and help you sustain um, sustain your energy um, or in the face of adversity, or in the face sometimes simply of boredom, uh, in the face of in the face of something taking a long time, something you know, most worthwhile things take a long time to do. Uh, and Raspberry Pi is no exception. Um, so I've been very lucky. I mean, primarily I've been very lucky with my family. Um, actually, so I've been very lucky. Um, I've very, been very lucky to have uh, to have uh, parents and to have a sister who, in the early days of Raspberry Pi, when I'd had the idea, when we started off uh, down this road, but I was prone to getting bored and wandering off, and I'm a bit of a magpie, uh, sort of chasing off after different things, and would keep truing me out, would keep me bring, keep bringing me back to this. Well, I would describe some new enthusiasm I had. Uh, and all of my close family members would say to me when I described some new enthusiasm, yes, that's great, but what about that Raspberry Pi thing you were telling us about? Go back and do that. Um, and so I've been very, very lucky with my uh, with my, my, my parents, my, my, my sister. Um, but of course, most importantly, I've been very, very lucky in my uh, in my marriage. Um, uh, I've been married to uh, I've been married to Liz since I've been with Liz for 25 years now. So I've been with Liz since 1990. I've been married to her since 2004. Um, and so all of those sort of experiences which led to the Raspberry Pi program uh, are not just experiences that I've had. They're experiences I had alongside Liz. Um, and while I was having a bunch of experiences, a bunch of technical experiences, um, which positioned me very well to um, uh, to to um, participate in the design of the Raspberry Pi. Liz was having, Liz was a former journalist, I was having a bunch of experiences of her own which positioned her very well to, to run our communications function. Um, and so when we started, um, so this, this was, you know, having somebody in your life who cares about the same stuff that you do um, and has a set of complementary skills, um, uh, it was just, it, it's turned Raspberry Pi from being fun but hard work into just fun i think very lucky obviously liz was a journalist she was willing uh keen to uh drop some of that work on the floor uh and come and run our communications and our community function you know, long before we were an organization did the community uh, communications function um liz was responsible for um uh you know um uh, building and sustaining the raspberry pi community uh she's still with us um, uh, she's still with us today. She runs the entire communications organization within, within, the, within the company. Great. Well, thank you um, very much, um, Ibn. This was uh, my final question in our conversation. So thank you for such a thought-provoking conversation and for taking the time to share with us your remarkable and unique business journey. Uh, we looked uh, forward to seeing what the next 10 years holds for the Raspberry Pi Foundation and wish you every success. Uh, and as always, a big thank you to all um, alumni and other members of the uh, CJBS community who have joined us. So thank you again, Eben, and uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed.